This program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash uctv prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Before I get started, I just wanted to thank Mike for the uh, invitation to this uh, outstanding meeting. Uh, as far as uh, disclosures that are germane to my talk, um, notice up there I've uh, consulted for several uh, biologic companies, and uh, I'll be re reporting the results for some of these trials. So when we talk about uh, using biologics to treat patients with critical limb ischemia, we're, um, for the most part, talking about this concept of angiogenesis, or the growth of new blood vessels from pre-existing blood vessels. And uh, really, that's used to treat ischemic disease in so-called therapeutic angiogenesis. And this revolves around ischemic heart disease or peripheral vascular disease. And currently, uh, the vast majority of these trials are actually looking at treatment of patients. I hate to use the term CLI at this point, but that's what I'm stuck with. So for patients with severe uh, uh, tissue loss or rest pain. The, uh, and this is different from vasculogenesis, which is what happens uh, in embryo as blood vessels develop, or arteriogenesis, which is the development of collaterals. So these angiogenic, gene, angiogenic trials uh, you, you, uh, deliver an angiogenic factor to the ischemic limb, and that can either be through a cell therapy approach, which I'll touch on in the second half of the talk, or uh, delivering a growth factor or a transcription factor. And because you want to have the growth factor expressed for a, a significant amount of time, this is usually delivered as gene therapy through a plasmid or some type of an adenovirus. And the big concern in what's sort of held the field back is it's developed the potential complications of uh, angiogenesis, the concept of off-target angiogenesis where the patient may have a small occult tumor that may subsequently start to flourish, or in uh, diabetic patients that they develop a progression of their uh, proliferative retinopathy. So for gene therapy, the vast majority of the trials, the patient undergoes injection of the gene into the ischemic limb. The expectation is that the uh, uh, gene is then either the plasmid or the adenovirus is taken up into the skeletal muscle where the uh, gene is transcribed and the uh, respective protein is then secreted and then hands its uh, uh, therapeutic effect. In the early uh, investigator, the early sort of father of this field is Jeff Eisner, who uh, looked at uh, vascular endothelial cell growth factor and, and did a number of studies. These are all open label studies showing that he could get ischemic wounds to heal over time uh, with using this VEGF gene therapy. The problem is that he really never used any placebo controls. And with, because of the heterogeneity within the CLI population, you really, and because of the uh, sort of uh, the uh, endpoints don't happen with a frequent regularity, you really need placebo controls in order to prove proof of efficacy. So the FGF is sort of the the, uh, the gene therapy that's been looked at and studied the most. There was a trial that was published in 2008, which was the phase two trial looking at F FGF gene therapy in, in CLI. And they had a 12-month endpoint, and the results of this trial were um, pretty spectacular. If you look here, you can see that the FGF-treated patients, there's 100 patients, had a, a significant improvement in their amputation-free survival compared to placebos. And they had about a 50% reduction in amputation and a 50% reduction in death. So this was a pretty dramatic uh, phase two trial. These investigators then went on to, to show proof of concept because up until now, really, you know, in animals, we know that, uh, that if you inject them with a gene that they'll, the skeletal muscle will express the protein and you can see angiogenesis. But in the 80-year-old uh, diabetic, it certainly uh, it was really unclear as to um, whether, there was, whether this FGF therapy could work at all. 
And what they did is they took six patients who are about to undergo lower extremity amputation and they underwent injection of the FGF plasmid. They then took the amputation specimens and they examined and found uh, plasmid expression, mRNA, as well as protein uh, expression for FGF. So really this was proof of concept at least that the gene therapy uh, w could potentially work. So they went on to then do the uh, phase three pivotal trial, the results of which were reported in the Lancet last year. They had 525 patients treated with FGF versus placebo. There was absolutely no effect between, difference between the two groups. The amputation-free survival, amputation and death rates were all quite similar. And so the question is, you know, why are these results from this phase three trial so different from the uh, phase two trial? Well, the phase two trial was performed uh, exclusively in Europe. And uh, while the phase three trial was performed in about 200 sites throughout the world. You know, so there may be some difference in the patient population, but I think for the most part, you know, this is a type example of a type two error, and this is why you need to do phase three trials. A second uh, growth factor, hepatocyte growth factor, um, which is the one that I've been more involved with, is uh, thought to be a more robust angiogenic factor compared to VEGF or FGF. It activates the uh, ETS1 transcription factor, which then involves the regulation of multiple different genes in the angiogenic process. We reported the results of a phase two trial, which uh, we published in circulation in 2008. And this was uh, a dose finding trial looking at placebo as well as three different doses of the HGF plasmid. And, it, and for all of these trials, the reason I show this is just that in general, the trials are very strict about what sort of patients are allowed into the trial. So you have to have hemodynamic confirmation of the critical limb ischemia, either based on TCPO2, toe pressure, or ankle pressure. The uh, baseline uh, incidence of tissue loss across the groups was pretty similar at around 70% uh, of the patients had uh, tissue loss. Uh, you can see the TCPO2, uh, the mean for the groups, except for the, uh, one of the middle dose groups was relatively low at 20, and the toe brachial index was also quite low. With regards to safety, uh, again, this is a, a sort of an example of all CLI trials. So if you're involved in a CLI trial, these are the sort of problems you're going to face. There were 750 adverse events for 97 subjects. Almost every subject in the trial had at least one adverse event, and this was due mostly to the uh, comorbid disease burden. There were 11 new neoplasms that developed. It, the first was a uh, colon cancer that developed, and these patients are all extensively screened before they're allowed into the trial. So when this patient developed a colon cancer, the trial was shut down, the DSMB was uh, conferred, and it turned out it was in one of the placebo-treated patients. If it had been one of the uh, gene therapy-treated patients, the trial probably would have been closed uh, possibly indefinitely. So as far as the results from this phase two trial, uh, the uh, primary endpoint was change in TCPO2 from the baseline. So you can see in red is the TCPO2 at baseline for the placebo group, low dose, and through to the high dose gene therapy group. And then at six months, the green bar shows the TCPO2 at six months. And you can see there is really no difference between baseline and six months in the placebo, low dose, or middle dose group. There may be a little bit of a trend there, but it's not significant. It's not until you get to the high dose gene therapy group where the TCPO2 doubled. And this was significantly different. Another way to look at this is to look at how, what percentage of patients get their TCPO2 to be greater than 30, because 30 is sort of the, the break point where we would expect the possibility for wound healing. And you can see sort of a dose response curve here, but the high dose gene therapy group at uh, six months, 80% of the patients, their TCPO2 had increased to, to greater than 30. But some of the things we learned in doing these trials, uh, one was that we needed to keep a close eye on what sort of patients as far as with regards to their wound were being allowed into the trial. You would think that by describing, you know, a group of patients with critical limb ischemia and the hemodynamics that we might get a relatively homogenous patient population, but that wasn't the case. So we got, we got patients with ischemic ulcers like this here, but we also got patients who were missing most of their forefoot who really had no hope of ever being able to salvage this foot. And we even had patients who were being enrolled in the trial with, who didn't even have ischemic ulcers and were having venous stasis ulcers. So, you know, learning from this first phase two trial, we went on to a second phase two trial. 
and this was uh, looking at toe brachial index, and here we targeted only patients with tissue loss, because uh, the other information that we learned is that, as Dr. Andros was suggesting earlier, patients with some types of critical or severe ischemia of their leg really have uh, relatively good limb salvage rates. For instance, rest pain patients, their am major amputation rate at 12 months is less than 10 percent. It's probably around 5 percent. So here we're looking at only patients with tissue loss, and we're looking at the ankle brachial index over time. The HGF-treated patients are in red, and the placebo-treated patients are in green. And you can see the HGF-treated patients actually had a very minor increase in their ankle brachial index. It went from like 0.9 to 0.24. It wasn't significant. But the uh, placebo-treated patients had a continued deterioration in their uh, ABI until at six months there was a significant difference between the groups. And to my mind, this actually makes a little more sense than what we see um, with other trials in that, you know, we're not doing a bypass or we're not doing, we're not reopening an occluded SFA here. So I wouldn't expect to see a big increase in the ankle brachial index. What I think is more interesting, because in the, these are all blinded uh, investigators, is that we saw a significant improvement in the pain score in the HGF-treated patients over time compared to the placebo-treated patients shown in green. So that, again, at six months, there was a significant difference between the groups. And then this then uh, dovetails with a, uh, well, this just shows this, this is the sort of patients who are being enrolled in this trial. So it wasn't uh, like small ulcers that we were sort of cherry picking. These were patients that were sort of coming in. And with regards to the wound, there, was, you know, there wasn't a lot of exclusion uh, criteria. And this sort of dovetails with a, a phase three trial that was being done in Japan at the, the uh, same time, again, looking at patients with CLI. And this trial was stopped early um, by the DSMB because of a, a uh, wound ulcer improvement rate of 70% in the HGF-treated patients versus 30% in the placebo. And uh, unfortunately, the DSMB stopped the trial probably too early because when the sponsor went to the uh, Japanese government for approval, uh, because only 40 patients were in the trial, they, uh, ref they put it on hold until the results of the uh, U.S. pivotal trial are completed. So the summary for the HGF trial, I think, you know, it's well tolerated. And one of the big issues is concerns over safety. And I think that it has a relatively good safety profile at this point. Uh, and so it did improve limb perfusion, though these are surrogates that we looked at in these phase two trials. And so the, the pivotal trial, which is expected to start sometime later this year, you know, will answer the question. So for the next uh, five or seven minutes, I'll talk about uh, stem cell therapy, which, to be honest, I think it actually has generated much more excitement as far as biological therapies uh, than the uh, gene therapies have. Uh, one of the, uh, it's, you know, for the most part felt to be safer because you're taking the uh, patient, usually these are autologous or the patient's own stem cells derived from the uh, bone marrow we get from the iliac crest, and they're just being moved around within the body. So there's left, less concerns about the off-target angiogenesis. And there's been a series of, uh, within the past six months, there's been about three different uh, phase two trials that have uh, shown, that have uh, published their results. The first of which is Harvest Technologies, and this is a, a phase two trial of bone marrow aspirate. And the way that this works is that the uh, patient has uh, about 300 mLs of bone marrow uh, removed from the iliac crest. It's then concentrated with a proprietary uh, cell preparatory system. The, and then at the point of care, right at the time that the bone marrow is removed, the uh, bone marrow is usually concentrated from about 300 mLs down to about 30 mLs, and then it's injected into the ischemic limb. And the expectation is that by injecting it into a, a limb that has a low, uh, that is relatively hypoxic, that this will then drive the cells to differentiate into uh, some sort of cell that's going to actually, you know, the, the mechanisms behind how it works are unknown, but it's possible it may drive the cell to develop a more vascular orientation and promote angiogenesis, or these cells may act like little cytokine factories that just secrete multiple different growth factors. The actual mechanism is unknown. But you can see in the results of their trial, when they, this is an, they had 48 patients, they were randomized two to one, bone marrow concentrate to controls. And the endpoint's early at three months, so it's really hard to make too much about that with such an early endpoint. But you can see that major amputation was lower in the bone marrow concentrate group, improved pain was, improved pain was better in the bone marrow group, improved ABI in the bone marrow group, and improved Rutherford classification. Because of the small number of patients, there was no significant difference between the groups. But the trends in general are there. 
So we've recently published uh, both the interim analysis and then uh, last month the uh, final analysis of a, another phase two trial looking at uh, autologous stem cells in patients with uh, critical limb ischemia. In this trial, we were using uh, tissue repair cells, and these cells are obtained by uh, doing a bone marrow aspirate of about 50 mLs. They're then sent to the sponsor. Sponsor places them in a proprietary bioreactor where the cell lines are expanded. Then two weeks later, they're returned uh, to the site where they're injected into the ischemic limb. And patients were randomized to tissue repair cells versus placebo, and the injections occurred over about 20 different injections, uh, which included onto the foot, and these uh, occurred one time um, two weeks after the bone marrow aspirate. The primary endpoint was uh, time to first occurrence of treatment failure, and this included uh, major amputation, mortality, doubling of the wound size, uh, de novo gangrene, or the need for revascularization. So this is a surrogate endpoint, again, because it's a small, relatively small phase two trial. This is a demonstration of the, the, the cells. Once the uh, sponsor receives the cells, they uh, place them into a bioreactor where the uh, cells can be perfused with um, culture media, and this is done for a two-week period of time. Once this is completed, the uh, cells are analyzed, and you can see that the cell lines that are actually expanded, because the total number of cells actually decreases between the time that they receive the cells until the time the cells are uh, sent back to the investigator. The cell lines that are expanded include uh, mesenchymal stem cells as well as monocytes, which are expected to modulate uh, inflammation. So if we look at, the, uh, look at the patients who were treated, you can see this is, again, the safety analysis. And again, it just shows that the adverse event rate is quite high in both groups. And this is uh, pretty much standard for any uh, CLI trial. When we look at uh, the difference between the uh, two groups with regards to time to treatment failure, these, the patients treated with the stem cells are in the dotted line. Patients treated with uh, the uh, placebo are in the solid line. You can see a significant difference between the two groups. And this is a composite endpoint, so you want to see what drives the composite endpoint. And uh, there's no difference in mortality between the groups. There is trends as far as difference in uh, major amputations occurred less frequently in the stem cell treated groups. Wound doubling occurred less frequently, and a new onset of gangrene occurred less frequently. This is the, uh, shows the difference between amputation-free survival, and you can see, again, there's not uh, very much difference between the groups. But when we, uh, again, remembering that this trial compared, uh, included patients with rest pain as well as patients with uh, tissue loss, and knowing that the rest pain patients are unlikely to have an amputation over time, when we looked at the data to look at what happened in patients with tissue loss, we saw a more dramatic difference. So on the left is time to treatment failure of patients only with tissue loss. And you can see that the placebo-treated patients who entered the trial with tissue loss by one year, about 15% of them did not have an amputation. When you can compare that to the patients with the uh, stem cell treatment, again, a significant difference. And over here, you can see the difference in amputation between the two groups. So in conclusion, the, uh, with regards to the stem cell treatment so far, I think that we can say that it's very safe. Um, you know, all the trials have shown some improvement in various composite endpoints, which include uh, beneficial effects on wound healing as well as the decreases in amputation, and that the early results are promising. So at the present time, there's a host of uh, ongoing cellular therapy trials, which I've outlined here. Autologous stem cells, meaning from the, own pa from the patient themselves. There's the ASTRM trial, which is in phase three, which is the cell-expanded uh, cell therapy. Harvest Technologies and Biomet, which both use a cell preparation system where the patient, you harvest 300 mLs of uh, bone marrow from the patient and then they're injected into the ischemic limb, are also now in phase three trials. And then there, there's also some interesting uh, uh, trials that are being developed using allogeneic cells. Uh, the pluristem has a, a placental-derived uh, stem cell line in which the plus, the, uh, these placental-derived stem cells are uh, supposedly immunologically immune and, and therefore can be used. In, uh, the, the appeal here is that could be sort of an off-the-shelf therapy, but they're in uh, early, uh, early phases of phase two, phase two development. 
So in conclusion, this could be a potentially very disruptive technology. This could drastically alter how we uh, potentially treat patients. But uh, you know, again, it depends on the outcome of the pivotal trials. And it's important to point out that while all of the data I've shown you is appealing, there is no pivotal phase three trial, which has shown that any of this stuff actually works. But it, you know, we're going to, I think that probably within three years, we'll start to see some of the data from the uh, phase three trials. And uh, so time will tell. But I think as vascular surgeons or people who are interested in taking care of patients with uh, critical limb ischemia, it's important for us to be involved in these trials in order to determine where th this sits in our armamentarium of, of what sort of patients we think that would, uh, these would be best to use these in. Thank you.